I mean, to, to, he's always... Um, Oh, what's the name of the guy from the thick of it? Malcolm Turner. Malcolm Turner. Yeah. Have you That's seen always from? Have me. you seen Local Hero? No. Oh, I, seriously, one of you know the eighties is a golden age for movies, but one of my like top three eighties movies. It's so good. Interesting. And he, that's where he came from. That was he was before that. I think he was like playing in a punk band in Glasgow or something. No way. And they and they just and they saw him doing it and were like that guy, and they and he just plays this kind of nerd. And it's just fabulous. Local Hero. It's about oil exploration off the coast of Scotland. And it's the one of the strangest films. I'd highly recommend it. Great soundtrack as well. Okay. I'll definitely have to check that out. But anyway, right. Let's get going. Yeah. We can stop, so, stop talking about Peter Capaldi. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a nice way to lead in. Mm-hmm. But um, so, yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I am here with Oliver Bullock, author of Butler to the World. Thanks for the copy. Um, and Moneyland as well, and I'm sure a couple of other books um, that escape the name. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for agreeing to chat. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me here. Mm. So yeah, it took it took a little time to get you to get you here, but we got you here eventually. So how are, how is Britain the world's butler? Like, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> well. Okay. In order to answer that question, I need to go back in time a little bit because I'm a like a Russophile. I've always been, ever since I was a kid, much to the amusement of my parents, I've always been really interested in Russia, the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, all of those things. So I grew up in the 1990s and that at that time, Russia was, you know, it had overthrown communism. It was going through this convulsion. Democracy was sort of building. And I suppose I had this rather naive idea that, that I could move to Russia and witness you know, the development of a new democracy, of a new political culture, the kind of thing that you that only ever happens once, right? You know, because at that time, there was this sort of strange optimistic idea that the, you know, liberal democracy had won, right? There was this idea, the end of history, mm. this Francis Fukuyama book, you know, that liberal democracy had won and everyone's going to become Denmark, you know, or, or I don't know, America, whatever. <laughs> um, so I moved to Russia in the late 90s and became a journalist um, and what I saw obviously was not the development of democracy in Russia. In, in fact, it was the opposite. Just after, uh, I just before I moved there, a couple of weeks before I moved there, um, Vladimir Putin became prime minister for the first time. And then he's been in power either as prime minister or president ever since. And he has overseen this, you know, first gradual and then more sudden erosion of all of the rights that were created in the 1990s, political rights, business rights, media rights. You know, he has brought everything in-house from organised crime, football hooligans, whatever. It is all now in the service of his regime. And so, you know, there was this, a lot of talk about how the oligarchs were taking over, how this kleptocracy was being created, corruption was becoming, you know, deeply embedded and all this. And it was obviously a real problem. And that's what you know, as journalists, we used to write about and I used to write about. Um, and yet there was always this strange, like, backbeat in my mind, which is when editors would phone up and say, this, you know, this guy's just bought a mansion in London. The biggest house in London after Buckingham Palace has just been bought by some Russian guy. Who is he? Or, like, some Russian guy's just bought a football club here. Who, who is he? Or some Russian guy's just, you know, given a load of money to build a new wing on an art gallery. Who is he? And it was like, how... How are they oligarchs when they're in Russia? And yet, they just all they've got to do is fly to the UK and they become entrepreneurs or philanthropists. Like, where, like how does that work? And, and, it, and it, it was so sort of normal that it took a little while for me to realise how weird that is. That the same people, all they had to do was move to the UK and they would become something different, something cleaner, something respectable. Mm. And, and so I became really interested in, this, in the UK's role as a recipient of this money. And then the more I looked into sort of financial crime and corruption, the more I realized that we're not just a recipient of this money. We are like deeply in, embedded in every scam, every money laundering venture, every legal attack on journalists, everything. There is always, but always a UK role. Um, and, you know, oligarchs are good at some things, right? They're good at stealing companies, you know, knocking off political rivals, like, you know, rigging elections, all that stuff. But, you know, they're not good at, the sort of soft skills you need to, to be integrated into a global economy to, to, you know, to rebrand yourself as a philanthropist, to list your shares on the London Stock Exchange, to you know, all that kind of stuff. And it, and it occurred to me that what Britain was doing was, was, was transforming oligarchs into philanthropists, transforming oligarchs into entrepreneurs, allowing them to rebrand themselves, allowing them to, to, to set sail on the sort of ocean of the global economy 
as if they were legitimate people rather than people who just use their political connections to steal a fortune, which is basically what not all of them, but most of them are. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and I suppose I was thinking, well, you know, what, what is Britain doing there? And, you know, in one way, we're being like a consigliere in a mafia movie, right? You know, the assistant to the Don, you know, the, like in, but that's, you know, what do you think when consigliere, you think like in the back room of an Italian restaurant in Brooklyn, like white vests, like pasta. It's not a British thing, right? So what's the British equivalent? And then it occurs to me, well, butler, like you're a butler, you're, you're, you know, beautifully dressed, you know, well-mannered. You've got, you know, all the sort of quotes from, you know, fine literature in your head. You've got white gloves, you open the door softly, but you're utterly amoral. You just do what you're paid to do and you'd sort problems out. And that's essentially what it occurred to me Britain was doing. Um, so that's what I mean by butler to the world. We're sort of at the elbow of anyone who'll pay us. They might not be evil. They might just be naughty. They might not even be naughty. They might be perfect. You know, whoever, whoever they are, if they can afford our services, we'll solve their problems. And we're really, really good at it. Yeah, worryingly good at it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's kind of extraordinary the extent to which this sort of metaphor, which I came up with in a conversation um, uh, completely accidentally, really. I was trying to explain Britain's sort of political economy to an American, um, which I came up with accidentally. The more the more I thought about it, the more perfect it was. And and since the book has come out, the more um, the more it's you know the more examples of it happening I saw. There was this extraordinary one the other day when Alexei Navalny, the uh, Russian jailed Russian uh, opposition politician, an anti-corruption activist, his investigators revealed that according to them the Scheherazade, a, a huge super yacht which has been um, uh, seized by Italian authorities actually belongs to Vladimir Putin um, and they'd obtained a crew manifest for the crew and all of the crew are Russian, every single member of the crew is Russian and many of them employed by the federal I suppose it's the Federal Guard organization. It's like the, 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 like the equivalent of the US Secret Service. They guard the Kremlin. All of them employed by that, apart from the captain who's British. You know, and that's the, and, and that's it. Like that's, it's always like that. You know, you, you've got the wealth managers, you know, the actual literal butlers. You know, there's a, it's all the way through. You end up with, with British people in these highly skilled servant jobs. You know, top of the tree, you butler, the, you, you, you know, you run the household. And that's sort of that. And obviously it's not everyone in Britain, right? There are loads of people in Britain who do other things, but it's a surprising, particularly at the top of society, it's a surprisingly deep involvement in essentially butlering to the world's richest people, whoever they are. And, you know, we talk a lot about Russians because A, I'm a Russianist. B, obviously Russia's invaded Ukraine and everyone's talking about Russia. But this isn't just butler to the Russians. No. It's butler to the world, whoever they are. You know, if we if the Russians are knocked out of the business for whatever reason, you know, we're not going to starve. Um, there's plenty of other people to be butler to. Yeah, well, I mean, the, there's plenty of plenty of dirty money sloshing around the world. I mean, as as your other book, Moneyland, kind of um, illustrates. But one of the things that struck me, like through reading the book, was the sort of like ad hoc way in which these services and and the offshore world and all the tax havens, places like uh, Gibraltar, or the, with, especially with the gambling um, industry, that was a fascinating chapter. Yeah, mental. But the way this all sort of like built up in a very, it sort of just happened. Do you know what I mean? And and it, it, it really made me think about this weird idea that some of us have in the modern day that, like I discussed this with my best friend quite a lot. We were like, you know, it would have been so much easier to be like a swindler 30, 50, 100 years ago. Cause you know, there were so many gaps in rules and you know, there was like play, like little like gray areas in which you could make money or like, you know, the bureaucracy, it feels like in, at least in the modern world where most of us live gets in the way of that kind of, life like yeah for better or worse but when when i started reading um, the book about about all these places i was like hang on this is where all the gray areas have gone like <laughs> these they still exist they're just they're no longer like in the back streets of of like little shady alleys it's it's like in the the wealthiest parts of the world you know what i think they always were i think the thing is that that when we talk about swindlers right we we talk about the people who get put in prison, who tend to be people too poor to afford the best lawyers, um, you know, the people who, who don't have the political connections, right? You know, it's the real crimes, 
you know, I mean, there's a saying, isn't it? The real crime is what's legal. Like, that's what mm. I'm fascinated by. The fact that you have this, if you are well-connected enough, and if you are, you know, let's face it, bold enough, if you have the chutzpah, you're prepared to, to make these huge plays for just to change, you know, the entire sort of political economy of the world, which is essentially what the story is that I'm telling. And But you make a really good point about the fact that in a way it just happened, because... You know, there's often a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very guilty of this. I love having these long, drunken discussions about trying to explain something. Is this, was this corruption or incompetence? Like what, like, okay, the British government, right, le right now, okay, not doing a great job. I think most people could agree. No, is that corruption or is that incompetence, right? And obviously, you know, most people would argue that it's a mixture of the two and it's, you know, and blood and fire, but, you know, that's fine. But I actually think that there's a third concept, which which we don't have a word for. And I keep trying to come up with a term for, like a single term, which is things that are accidentally profitable. Um, and they're not, you know, they weren't designed, they weren't deliberate, they weren't intentional, but once you stumbled across them, that's pretty good. Mm. So we just keep making money out of that. And there's no real need to tell anyone because why would you reveal it? And because there's no one who really knows apart from the people on the inside, there's no real fuss about it. So there's no real stress to, to, to close this particular loophole you've discovered. So, I mean, you know, at the core of this book um, is this, the development of London, the city of London as an offshore financial services center. So having been the engine of the British empire, the place that, you know, dealt in the sterling system, the pound, the, you know, the currency of the world, you know, and with the Royal Navy, like steaming out bravely to conquer foreigners <laughs> and, you know, all that stuff. It, obviously the city of London changed at some point into a place that just services other people. It doesn't serve, you know, the British national economy anymore because it, it's not, you know, a thing. So, so when did that happen? And that's the core of the transformation is this creation of offshore as an idea and as a concept. And actually that it's something we just live with. We're used to it, but, but looking at it at the very beginning of how it happened, it, it was an, an accidental discovery mm. by some literally just a, a small group of bankers who realized that if, and at the time, this is in the 1950s, the world financial movements were very, very restricted to try and stabilize the economy after World War II. They realized that if they just traded with dollars in London instead of pounds, it was as simple as that. If they used dollars instead of pounds, then there were suddenly no rules mm. um, because there were rules for pounds in Britain and there were rules for dollars in the States. But if you took the dollars to London, there were no rules of any kind. So, and if there are no rules, you make more money than other people who have to obey rules. And so everyone came to London, like the American banks came, the Japanese, the Germans, the French, everyone came to London because everyone wanted a piece of this incredibly profitable deal, which was just, wow, strings free money. Um, and it totally transformed the world. And it totally transformed the world in the interests of the owners of wealth. Because if you're you know, what they wanted to be able to do was move money between countries. Mm. And who wants to do that? Well, people with enough money to move between countries. Like most of us don't have that. It's not, it's not a pressing concern. I'm not like, how am I going to move my dollar, dollar holdings from Buenos Aires to, to, you know, Brasilia? That's not something I worry about, not having any dollar <laughs> holdings. But so, so they transform the world economy in the interest of people with money and therefore against the interest of everyone else. And that's what Britain does. Mm. Britain has consistently whether talking dealing with Russians or dealing with people from the Gulf states from the 1970s or dealing with Chinese billionaires more recently, it's constantly skewing the game in their favor and earning fees from doing so. And, you know, and it's a very profitable business and it's the core business of the city of London or, or you know, London more broadly. It's not only just confined in the, in the square mile anymore. Mm. Like one of the things that, that was really fascinating to me reading the book was the extent to which the, the the state of the financial, like the global financial world in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, where you're describing it, where it starts to change with the, with the Bretton Woods Agreement in that yeah. sort of post-war era, the extent to which the way things operated then are so inconceivable to me. Like, I, I just, I, even... This this idea is like, oh, you can't, it, you know, it was difficult to move money around. Yeah. And I've come across this idea before when I was reading, um, oh, goodness, what was it? I think it was Owen Jones' book, The Establishment. Yeah. And he was talking about how Thatcher had um, scrapped um, almost all the capital controls through the 70s and 80s. And I was just like, hang on, 
there were capital controls. I mean, <laughs> what, what's what's really interesting about that, um, and, and Ronald Reagan, you know, did similar things in the US. Um, what's really interesting about that is what Thatcher and Reagan were essentially doing was catching up with what had already happened. So it's often talked about this of the neoliberal revolution of the late 70s and early 80s in the UK and the US yeah. um, and how, you know, they totally revolutionized financial services. Actually, all they were doing was transforming the onshore economy so it now matched the offshore economy. The offshore economy had become so big, the, the unregulated part of the financial services sector, that they just essentially just transformed the onshore bit so it looked like the offshore bit. So what we have now, all dollars are now offshore. There is no such thing as an, an onshore and offshore dollar. They're the same thing. Um, you know, what, essentially, the, in order to look for an equivalent to what it was like, you need to look to somewhere like, well, say Russia at the moment, which has, a, has capital control. So you end up with a black market in currency. What Britain created, we call it offshore, was a black market in dollars. Um, it was just a, a nicer way of, of calling it. Um, you know, I used to I, I used to live in Central Asia. In Uzbekistan, there was a black market in SOM, which was their currency. And you could see the exchange rate change depending on how close you were to where the heroin came across the border because it was you know, a big drug smuggling route. And that was essentially what we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, a purely market driven, you know, pure supply and demand determining interest rates and, and exchange rates, which is not what governments wanted at the time. Um, yeah, you know, it's amazing to think that the American government put a restriction on the on the interest rates that banks were allowed to charge for lending out money. It wasn't just what the market would bear. There was a limit. And that was what the American government deemed acceptable. And that's what the offshore market was designed to circumvent. It was all these attempts by, you know, if we're being crude, the people, you know, democracy, the democratically elected government to put limits on wealth in the interests of everyone else. Mm. And that is really annoying if you've got wealth. Yeah. yeah. But if you look at it in the other way, you know, one of the reasons why the 1960s is spoken about as this golden age is if you look at just the statistics, that's the period in human history with the lowest wealth inequality, the period with the most continuous economic growth in Western countries. It was it was a golden age, you know, particularly in America, in, in you know, in, in Western Europe. In, and it was just extraordinary. You know, young people were, were were advancing in wealth in a way that had never happened before. The freedom of, you know, the reason why it was such a boom time for sort of high street fashion and music and stuff is because young people had money, which they'd never had before. And that's because of this amazing system, which is destroyed by the city of London. So it's like, thanks, guys. You know, <laughs> you know I would have liked a bit of that. You know, yeah. not, not just my parents. Mm. I mean, it's probably... It's it's almost like that that period of prosperity where everyone became a little bit more moneyed sort of bred the desire for the money to be able to be hidden offshore like the, like if 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 say for for example if teenagers hadn't had the money to go out and buy all the beatles records and beatles memorabilia the beatles wouldn't have become unbelievably rich and then wouldn't have been looking for places to store their offshore money well, it's like this weird paradox yeah, yeah you're right george harrison never would have written tax man exactly and yeah exactly the rolling stones <laughs> never would have gone and recorded exile on main street and yeah. the you're absolutely right i mean it you know it is you know it is a you're right it's a it's a classic paradox it mm. is a situation whereby a success carries with it the secrets of the the, the, the seeds of its own collapse um you know it it requires a, a, a consistent degree of of concentration to recognize why something was put in in the first place you know an annoying regulation you know why was that you know why did we do that in the first place so, oh yeah because of the second world war and like and like what happens when you have rampant wealth inequality and financial speculation you end up with deep depressions and the rise of extremist political parties and that's why they brought those rules in in the first place but obviously by you know the 70s and 80s everyone's kind of forgotten about that and all they want to do is is just make money um and you know we have you know, if you look at certainly bits of Eastern Europe at the moment, Hungary, obviously, um, you know, they're with these very extremist political party running the country and controlling the country completely. Um, you know, that was born of the 2007-8 financial crisis. You know, that, you know, and, and it, the dynamic is very similar to what we saw in the 1930s. And you're like, well, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, and I think... Horrifying. Is well, it's hor word. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> horrifying. I mean, it is horrifying, and you know, and obviously at the moment, you know, we are going into what looks like a period of extreme economic turbulence, which is, you know, deeply worrying. And if you look at sort of all the, 
you know, the canaries and the coal mines, the big hedge funds and so on, which are just like, whoa, how much money have you just lost? You know, it's extraordinary. And, and you know, that's obviously going to, you know, a couple of months down the line, that's that train is going to hit the rest of us. You know, well, what's coming? Oh, and, uh, you know, so I suppose, you know, what, what I sort of, one thing I, I hope with the, with the, with the books I write, I hope that, like you say, it will alert people to the fact that, that other things were, were possible, you know, like there was a time when things were different. Things didn't always, weren't always like this. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, that's, that's one of the things that, that, that still, I sit and think about this a lot. I'm like, yeah. why can't we just tax them here? Like, it's always my thought. Yeah. It's like, look, uh, we're a sovereign nation, even more so thanks to Brexit. And, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think, like, look, like, we have the, we, surely we have the capacity to, like, break the stranglehold that this offshore world has on our economy. Because um, I believe you're familiar with uh, Nicholas Shackson's mm. um, book, The, the Finance mm. Curse. Yeah, and Treasure Island's both great books. Yeah. Mm. So I can go to Treasure Island. Oh, it's, I really recommend it's it. On, it's on the pile. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had to, I've had to read yours first, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I was stunned. Because, like, this is this is not... It's not like an inconsequential problem. It's like if, if, if the financial industry is, is becoming like utterly destructive to the British economy, eventually there's going to be nothing left but financial services. And then you, you left like incredibly vulnerable. It's like, and there's a, there's a great book called um, Why Nations Fail. Mm, yes. Okay. And they kind of plot this idea that, that progress and and sort of yeah a, an increase in the political and economic power of like the whole of the country tends to come when the elites as such decide that like giving up that power is better off for everyone for them as well and i don't understand why no one like in power or anyone with any influence whatsoever is not going hang on lads like this is a really bad idea. Like we're really screwed if everything goes south. And and, and well, I mean, what do you think it is that that makes us like sort of ignore this big elephant in the room? Well, I think there is. I mean, there are yeah, there are many points rising out of that question. Um, just to that direct question, um, I think that we overstate often how informed and i suppose uh how well analyzed politicians are you know that the idea that they would know um or have time to know or care um about what's happening is you know uh, i think unproven and you know in general I'd speak to some MPs who are you know, desperately concerned about this issue. Obviously, the kind of people I speak to are the people who are concerned about this issue, you know, and, and I can find it extraordinary how little people know about something that I consider to be so important, you know, and partly that feeds into the problem of being butler to the world. So many of our brightest and best people have gone into serving the interests of the world's oligarchs because that's where the money is, that you do end up with other people, you know, running the country. That's an issue. Um, partly this this very kind of febrile political times means that who would be a politician? You know, just the abuse you get. I mean, who'd want that? You know, you have to be pretty mentally robust to want that. And that's a sort of a, a different point. Um, and then I suppose a third point, you know, the beyond sort of what you were saying about where, when, when nations fell. And I think this is actually an idea that that book introduced me to. I can't quite remember. There's an American writer called Mansour Olson who, um, who, who wrote this, who had this whole theory about how states came into being in the first place about stationary bandits that at once upon a time people lived in little groups and you had bandits who went and stole stuff and then at one point they realized that it was more profitable instead of just making hit and run raids to just attack another group and then just stay there and just control them and steal stuff all the time because why you know why why steal stuff and go away when you can just stay there and steal it all the time now we now call it tax but that's basically what they were doing and but what's really interesting is once the bandit lives in the same group as the people who the bandit is stealing from or taxing, then the interests of the bandit and the group become aligned because the richer they become, the more the bandit can tax. 
So therefore you end up with a situation whereby the bandit starts not just stealing stuff, but wanting to sort of, you know, preserve, you know, stability in order to make sure that there's more stuff to tax. And eventually you end up with all the good stuff, you know, because you end up with the rule of law, because that's what you need to, to ensure stability. You end up with democracy. So you everyone agrees with the law. You end up with, you know, the sort of wonderful civilization that we have. And all of that comes from, according to Mansur Olson, and I find it very convincing as an, as an explanation, all of that comes from the fact that if the interests of the ruler and the ruled are aligned, because you have stationary bandits, then all else follows. Now, what does offshore mean? Right? Offshore means that the interests of the ruler in terms of looking after their wealth and the interests of the ruled are no longer aligned because the, because the wealth of the ruler is just somewhere else. Right? If you are ruling Russia, when it essentially comes down to it, if Russia collapses, you don't really have any skin in the game. Like you can, you, well, okay, yeah, that was that's a shame, you know. But you know, these things happen, and I'm just going to get on my plane and fly somewhere else, and and you know, and and that is a totally new phenomenon. Like that hasn't, you know, it is hard to overstate how new that is. I mean, you know, in the last fifty years, that has never happened in human history before, where people can predate, they can essentially colonize their own countries, you know, and and that is as a driver of instability and inequality is, is new and really alarming because, you know, you know, say what you like about, say, the Tsar of Russia, you know, but when things went south, he kind of went down with the ship. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, whereas if you look at the rulers of, say, Ukraine 2014, they had a revolution, you know, he's just got in a helicopter and he's gone. You know, um, you know the 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 rulers of you know, I know Kyrgyzstan with its multiple revolutions, but they've had three. They you know they're all living in Russia or Belarus. You know that's how it how they roll. You know the revolution happens and they're and they're gone. Um, and and that's different because if you can get your wealth out of the country, you don't have to worry about essentially the, your long term interests and the long term interests of the country you rule have diverged. And that's a new phenomenon. And and that's what. Uh, offshore has done and therefore if you trace offshore back to its beginning that's what london did you know london created this this system and other you know there's this argument you know consistently advanced by leading figures in the city of london throughout the 1960s and early 1970s that if london didn't do this someone else would so you know we may as well do it because if it's going to happen anyway we may as well be the ones who make money out of it right which is you know it's an interesting amoral argument anyway but but you know you can see the logic to it but if you analyse what London has and what London provides and what London does, it, it, the argument isn't true. It is, I mean, theoretically true, but there literally isn't anywhere else that can provide the range of butlering services that London provides. You know, in terms of, yes, Switzerland can hold your wealth for you, but it doesn't have the wealth management stuff, the libel stuff, the, you know, all that. And other places like America will educate your children very nicely. But you know, if you put your wealth there, you're going to be investigated by the FBI, you know. So in terms of a place that will keep your wealth safe, it won't investigate your wealth. It will sell you all the lovely bling that you want. It will educate your children. It will provide you super yacht captains. It will provide you literal butlers. All of that. London's the only place that can do those things, um, which is worrying and alarming, but also an opportunity because, you know, any changes that we can force the British government to make to check the origin of wealth that comes here to to investigate it to prosecute and so on to actually do some of those things um will have a disproportionate impact all over the world it will have a ripple effect all across the world because no one else does what we do therefore if we change the rules here then the rules change for everyone and that's really exciting mm. you know so i mean i try you know it, occasionally it can sound a bit forced being optimistic about a, a, a a topic which is as depressing as this but actually that's quite an optimistic thought that you know there aren't many things britain is world class at anymore you know like to put it mildly um but butlering you know we are you know the the, the bayern munich um is standing alone at the top of the tree of but or the, or the psg you know like we that's that's what britain is you know i mean that that's, in the, that's, in, that's in the german we'd never never do that well in europe that that's a good analogy i like that yeah yeah although though um you know uh, though what's his name did well in eurovision in probably but you yeah, know there you go sam oh, <laughs> not sam smith with sam. It, he looks like he should be swedish with his long hair but anyway yeah. he's not swedish <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why he did so well everyone thought he was swedish i don't know I mean, anyway. have you heard the controversy around all the eurovision votes i, I I, I've been I've been too busy following been, following, been, following Wagatha Christie been filling me in like there's yeah I don't even know what they think but there's like six countries whose like judges votes were scrapped and then they were yeah and then they all gave twelve points to Ukraine all of them Eurovision Gate 
Whoa. Well, yeah. but, well it's great. I mean, I mean, I'd say there's still investigations going on, but like I think it's as Azerbaijan um, have th have said that they're going to pull out of Eurovision now because they're like, yeah, they're like, well, hang on, wait, what? Why can't we have our own votes? <laughs> I, I couldn't be more delighted that Ukraine won. I have to say, but, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and if you know if that's what it takes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they would have won anyway. They won by loads of votes, didn't they? I mean, like, yeah. they're, they're, you know, I, to be honest, I've got no idea how it works, but the 400 and what's it votes that they got, mm -hmm. like, it was like, where do they come from? Um, you know, it's brilliant. Yeah, well, they were broadcasting from like a bunker under Kiev, I think, weren't they? The, yeah. the commentator, which is yeah. wild. I know. I mean, but they, you know, they, they, they like their Eurovision over there. Now you've got to have something to sing about. I mean, it, you know, but it's, I mean, one of the most extraordinary things about what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, I mean, coming off that, yeah. is the... You know, I, I, so I used to live in Moscow. I used to have friends in Kiev. And I would, quite regularly, on a Friday afternoon, I would think, you know what, I'm going to go to Kiev for the weekend. And, um, you know, I, I didn't... I, I foot loose and fancy free. How far is it? Um, it's an overnight train. So I would, you know, I'd go to the station, buy a train ticket, get on a train, wake up in Kiev. I'd be like, I'm here. I'm popping over for breakfast. And like, oh, brilliant. And then we'd all hang out for the weekend. And then I'd go back on Monday morning and go to work. And that was it. And... It was like going from, you know, London to Bristol. You know, I mean, it's a different country, but, you know, it felt part of the same kind of friendly space. Everyone had friends there, everyone had family there. And the idea that they are fighting each other, it's just like, it's so extraordinary and mad. It's like, yeah, like London and Bristol being at war. It's just extraordinary. And then, you know, on the front of saying, you know, they're going to host Eurovision, right? They've won. They have to host Eurovision. You're like, how is that possible? But this was like, it wasn't, how long ago was it? They had the Euros there, like what, in 10 years ago, mm. you know, and it was fine. And, and it's just extraordinary, you know, to think that, you know, that, that you know, they had games in, in Donetsk, which is now like a wasteland. Yeah. yeah it's just the, 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 what has happened to Ukraine is so extraordinary that it's almost, so stretches comprehension to, to think back to what Ukraine was like a decade ago. You know, it was this sort of totally ordinary place to have a European championships. And then, you know, who's to blame for that? Well, Putin's to blame for it. Why is he to blame for it? Well, because he was able to build up this kleptocratic, autocratic system with, you know, supported by a very tight, small group of just a few hundred oligarchs who essentially own everything. I mean, by some estimates, what's at the top 500 people in Russia? This is a pre-war estimate. It's probably worse now top 500 people in Russia had more wealth than the bottom 99.8% of the population. It's Whoa. like inequality that makes America look like, you know, uh, like a sort of the, the chosen land. And that system... That's, that's, a, that's, that's a ridiculous... I know. I mean, it's extraordinary. And it that bad. It's pretty bad. You know, and, and you know, I mean, that's, it's hard to estimate because of the offshore aspect, because mm -hmm. half of national wealth, more than half of national wealth is all is held outside the country. But still, you know, you're, you're looking at amazing inequality figures and the reason he was able to build up this system he doesn't you know putin doesn't know how to how to you know run a you know a modern financialized economy you know he had help and where do you get help from where do the oligarchs get help from well here the know, right here <laughs> and so you know all of these this appalling you know you get sort of ob obvious reasons looking at what's happening in ukraine you get sucked into the day-to-day -day of you know the the mariupol and, and Kharkiv and, and the sort of horrors of, of, you know, what's happening or the fight battle for Snake Island and all this stuff. But if you look at it, if you try and look at it over a decade long time scale, rather than just, you know, the day to day thing, you realize that, you know, this is a, a Russian war machine that has been, you know, enabled at the very least in the, in the, in the kindest way of putting it by the UK. And it really highlights how for a very long time, Britain has it's almost had two foreign policies. You know, we've had a, a foreign policy whereby we are, with our aid budget, we help the noble strivers for democracy and, and you know, free media and all this. And, and, you know, and that's true. And it happens. Money goes to, to support, you know, free media programs and demo, demo, democracy programs. And at the same time, you know, a different bit of our foreign policy is providing world class financial services to all the people who are killing the people that we're helping, you know. And that is just extraordinary. You know, what caused the problem in Ukraine? Well, basically corruption. And who helped them be corrupt? Well, we did. You know, we sold them shell companies. We moved their money. We sold them houses. And yet, who's now sending them weapons to... It's just, it, it's, it, they, there's a sort of disconnect and a failure to understand uh, that contradiction, which is at 
at the heart of government and, and, and never is expressed the recognition that really that, that, that there's a contradiction between what we say we do and what, and what we actually do. You know, it actually, the, the contradiction makes a lot of sense in the context of a, a fantastic quote that has just sprung to mind from um, it's either Yes Minister or Yes Prime Minister. And um, Sir Humphrey says, Britain has had the same foreign policy for almost 500 years to create a disunited Europe. <laughs> yeah. But like, before we go back to the... Well, I was gonna, I'm going I'm to trump that a little bit <laughs> with a, my favourite quote from Blackadder. Okay. Which is when Baldrick asks Blackadder why the First World War started. I mean, obviously he says it in a more sort of roundabout way, but essentially why did the First World War start? And Blackadder's answer is because it was too difficult not to have a war. I mean, that's and that I think is a really profound truth for a lot of things. Like, why didn't we work hard to help Ukraine develop and become a prosperous democratic self? Because it was too difficult not to have a war. Mm. A lot of hands. I don't. I you know because my I I've been attempting to not say too much about the Ukraine Russia thing because I don't know enough. Yeah. And the, like, what I, what I do know is that, like, five years ago, um, Zelensky was being touted as, like, the most corrupt leader in Europe. For whatever reason, I, I, don't, I don't understand enough of it. It's, like, it confuses me how he's become a hero. Obviously, it's because we don't want war. You know, Putin is not, not yet doing good things by invading. But I don't understand how he became the hero. And the other thing, the main thing I wanted to ask you, actually, about this, if we got to it. Yeah. It's like, what is, like, you've spent time in Russia. Like, what is Putin's end game here? Because people say he's crazy. And I don't think, I think that's a really bad way to look at it. Yeah, no, I he's don't. like, he's ex-KGB and you're never ex-KGB, but he's a sharp operator. And I don't think he does anything without like a, without thinking that he's going to come out on top. So in, so in answer to your first point about Zelensky, um, Zelensky and the entire Ukrainian political system um, is very hard to understand if you haven't spent time next to it um now it is the ukrainian political system is in i mean ukraine is also very unequal just like russia um and or was before the war i mean there's so much property has been destroyed who knows now um the and incredibly corrupt so these clans battling for control but unlike russia it's pluralistically corrupt so there are different clans you know regional clans so a donetsk clan a Dnipro clan kiev Odessa, all of whom battle for control and battle for, you know, all that. And so while it is corrupt, it's corrupt in a very different way to Russia. It's not got this pyramid of corruption with Putin at the top. And the, the reason for that is a very simple one, which is that it doesn't have the natural resources that Russia has. If you control the oil fields and the gas fields and, you know, nickel in Russia, you kind of control everything. So, so you don't really need anything else. Whereas in Ukraine, because it doesn't have that, it's sort of a lot of agriculture, like chemicals, you know, it, it's sort of heavy industry, <clears throat> agriculture, so on. It's much more difficult to control that as a pyramid. Like Yanukovych, the guy who was overthrown in 2014, tried to. And one of the reasons he failed is because he alienated so many of the other clans that, that, that they were prepared to stand by and allow him to be overthrown. Um, so <coughs> there are obviously, there are all questions bet between Zelensky's political allies, particularly this guy Kolomoisky, who was one of the um, uh, big oligarchs in, in Ukraine. And there are many questions about that. Um, with regard to what's happening, um, you know, I mean, Zelensky is definitely, it's very cometh the hour, cometh the man moment. He has, you know, redeemed himself spectacularly by his bravery in staying in his capital, despite the fact that, you know, everyone thought that Kiev would fall in days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is... I've been stunned how long it's going to be. It's an astonishingly brave thing to do. So I think, you know, he deserves a lot of credit for that, you know, und undeniably. Though, you know, that it does, you do wonder after the war, which hopefully will be soon, exactly what the fallout will be. But anyway, that's a different point. We don't need to talk about that. But with regard to Putin, um, you know, he is ex-KGB, it's true, and the KGB didn't take fools. However, the KGB was a very large organisation and it had many different parts and the very brightest people went into various bits. Now, he was also first directorate, which is the foreign intelligence wing, their equivalent of the of MI6, because it was all sort of wrapped together into one thing, or the CIA. Um, but he was posted to Dresden in East Germany. So he, he was posted to 
an, a less an under prestigious place in a very under prestigious country to be posted to. He wasn't. There are KGB people like his uh, Sergei Ivanov, who's a close political ally, who was in New York mm. is, for the KGB, or 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 people who are in London. Those were like big postings. You know, that's that's like you were the top of the tree if you got sent there. If you're sent to Dresden, that's a bit like being kind of an MI5 officer in Salisbury in Rhodesia in the 1970s. You know, it's still, it's good, but it's not great. So, you know, it, we shouldn't overestimate his sort of, his sort of slyness and aptitude and cunning. And also, I just, like on a pure human level, um, if you imagine that Tony Blair was still prime minister, right? So, I mean, they, you know, Putin became prime minister in 99, Blair was in 97. It's not that different. Um, if Blair was still prime minister, right, and since, say, about 2004-ish, had not had any political challenges of any kind, had had no media scrutiny of any kind, had been essentially given anything materially that he wanted, right, imagine what that would have done to his head. Mm. You know, imagine, imagine, I mean, even with the best will in the world, right, even if you are the most dedicated decent public spirited person in the world that is going to capsize your brain you can't that kind the degree of sycophancy the degree of you know consumption all of that and just the lack of information you, you need to be incredibly disciplined to maintain a sense of focus on what's really important that's putin he has had no challenge like for almost two decades really and you know, everyone telling him what he wants to hear, everyone surrounding him with, you know, bling, giving him what he wants. You know, he, it's not easy to retain your sense of, of sort of what's important for that long. I'd say it's probably impossible. This is why, end of, why presidential term limits are a good idea. Mm. And um, so I don't think he's crazy. No, he's a, he, he, you know, he clearly isn't. I mean, you could see, you know, how he acted in, in you know, his early years of his time in office when there was far more sort of media scrutiny of him and it's far easier to see what was happening. Um, he was a, a rational actor who, who, who did, you know, who took some really tough decisions. And I think had he stopped being president of Russia in 2008, history would remember him pretty kindly, but he couldn't, you know, get off the tree or get off the horse. Do you um, think he's become like a victim of the, the castle he's built himself? Yeah. He's like Louis the 16th. Mm. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I think. And, and so I think that, you know, if, if, yeah, the Russia has a very, you know, large intelligence industry. It had lots of people on the ground in Ukraine feeding back information and so on. But if essentially you were being rewarded for telling people what they wanted to hear, you know, the incentives are just to, you know, so he, I, I've no doubt that he thought that by sending troops into Ukraine, they would be welcomed with bread and salt and it, in days it would be over and they'd be able to impose a different government and everything would be fine. You know, he, I imagine in, in, in the worst case scenario, it would be like Budapest in 1956. You know, there might be a bit of fighting in the capital and then it would be all over and it would be a fait accompli and everything would be fine. You know, and I, I think this is the fruit of what happens when you have, you know, a very out of touch politician at the top who's been flattered and told everything they want to hear and you know he is i think probably really 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 struggling to deal with it mm. and that is a perspective i have not heard from anyone that is very interesting i mean i can remember really clearly when i was living in moscow you know i used to go to the kremlin quite often because you know that was just part of the job being a journalist and you'd wait for putin he was always late and you know you'd sit around and wait for him and and even then it felt like he had this cocooned existence, you know, like the, if you imagine, you know, Tony Blair was giving, I mean, uh, Boris Johnson was giving press conferences or press briefings and was just routinely two hours late, right? He would be ripped apart by the media. Like it just it ripped apart. I mean, that was normal for Putin, two hours, two and a half hours, whatever. You just sit around and wait, you know, you'd, you'd go to sleep for a couple of hours. You know, that was just normal for him. I can remember when he gave a, a, he, a speech, there was a, a conference for the, about global warming and uh, so a couple of foreign politicians criticised Russia for not having joined this international effort to combat global warming called the Kyoto Protocol. Mm -hmm. and, and he responded as if he'd been sort of slapped in the face. He, sort of, he kind of got up, he was all kind of fury and bristling like a man in a pub who's, you know, had someone knock his pint over. You know, it was, and it, it was really unprofessional and weird. And, um, 
And I think, and that was, you know, 15 years ago. Mm. It's a little bit of Trump syndrome. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, that that sheltered existence. Yeah, but more so because, you know, let's face it, people have been mocking Trump as long as as Trump's been Trump, you know, and Putin didn't, you know, he doesn't have that, Mm -hmm. you know, not certainly not in, I mean, there was a guy, I think his name was Maxim Galkin, who was a, who was a Russian comedian. He was very funny. And he used to be on this, on the kind of evening news program on a Sunday night. Um, And he, he did this thing when he, you know, it was all quite gentle, the satire, because, you know, by by the sort of 2003 four, like you didn't take the piss out of Putin really. But he did this thing that had been Putin had done a, a, a speech with a with a note and with a page in his notebook, and he'd always turn the page in his notebook whenever he had to make a new point, and it and it was very noticeable. And Galkin did this whole thing of doing a speech, and then every time he turned the page, there'd be like a drum roll, like you know, and it was really funny, <laughs> but you know, but it was pretty mild political commentary. I mean, it literally all he did was add essentially drum rolls. That was it, and he and he got sacked. You know, that's it. How dare you bring drum rolls to a to a reference to our dear leader? You, know? you almost you could you could consider that to be a compliment. Yeah, I mean, it's the power of satire. Yeah, you know, but but in you know in the long run, you know, if you don't have people mocking you a bit, you know, you need to have people mocking you a bit or, or criticizing you or something. Otherwise, you 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 sort of vanish into a a weird world of conspiracies, which I think is where he's at. I mean, this this essay he wrote last summer about, you know, the, the oneness of the Ukrainian and Russian peoples. It's bonkers. Yeah, properly, like, like, like crazy Facebook, like crazy Facebook comments. What is the, like, being in Ukraine, like, what is the level of, like, sent- like pro-Russian sentiment in, like, the parts, in the, like, say, the east of Ukraine versus uh, the west of Ukraine? Like, is there, uh, you know, Crimea was, as far as I was, I've been informed. Yeah quite pro-Russian. Yeah, it, it was. A lot of Russians had retired to Crimea. Um, the place is historically Russian-speaking. There was obviously a very big Russian naval base there, which was a big employer. Um, so Crimea was always slightly different. Um, there there was, before sort of 2014, there was a difference between the east and the west of the country in terms of um, their connections to Russia. People who lived in the west who are first language Ukrainian speakers, though they tend to speak Russian as well, but as a second language. Whereas in the East, it's the other way around. Everyone speaks Ukrainian, but it's as a second language. Um, where the people were there would often go to Russia to work in factories and so on. They'd, you know, you know, go for a few months to work at a time in Russia. Whereas in the East, it was more people, in the West, people would more go to work in Poland. You know, so there was a difference in, in people's worldview and everything. But since 2014, it's been because since Putin annexed Crimea and 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 the and then the invasion of the east of the country began, um, there's been a real change in attitudes, even in the Russian-speaking parts. Um, and I found the the most remarkable demonstration of that. I remember this in 2014. It was hilarious when, you know, because Ukraine has you know, very well developed football culture, big football clubs. Um, of which the Shakhtar Donetsk and Dynamo Kiev are like the most famous, but like has from all the other cities as well. And they play against each other and they have ultras who, you know, like to have a, have a, have a scrap, um, like ultras everywhere. And they all have their songs, uh, you know, and then in 2014, they all adopted the same song. And it was um, to the tune of Speedy Gonzalez, that na, 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 na. And you'd have the whole crowd, like 60,000 men, going, na, 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 na. And then it would end with Putin huilo, which means Putin is a dickhead. <laughs> and, and you'd get this, like, like these huge stadiums. I remember, like, the most hilarious bit is when Ukraine went and played a qualifier in Belarus. And the whole Ukrainian crowd is singing this. And then the Belarusians start singing it too. Like, the whole stadium <laughs> is singing Putin is a dickhead. And, like, and, and, you know, Putin, in a way, I think his, like, from, you know, a Ukrainian perspective, his role is the great uniter of the Ukrainian nation. He brought them together um, in a way that, that no one else had managed to do. And because of, you know, he was so, it was so sort of egregious the way he preyed on them, you know, and at their moment of weakness. And, you know, and it's, yeah, there's been a, yeah, let's face, I mean, Ukraine isn't a perfect place by any stretch of the imagination. You know, read my books. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, there is a huge amount of corruption in, in Ukraine as well. Um, but it was always a much more pluralistic, open society than Russia, you know, by, you know, in, in this, certainly since the millennium. And, um, and it need that that need it needs to get credit for that because it doesn't you know you, you get a lot of nonsense talked about ukraine and and it you know it's just a 
Eastern European country like Poland or something. It's just another one of those. Like and and it, and it should just be left in peace to get on with being an Eastern European country. You know, and the you know the age when big neighbours got to dominate Eastern European countries should have passed a long time ago. Mm. Yeah, probably. So to go back to get back to the butlering. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can go on about Ukraine all day. Um, so, are there any benefits to being the world's butler? Do we see, like, is there a good bit of this? Well, the, I mean, yeah, it's benefits for the people who earn the fees. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, so yeah, it's 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 reborn. The city of London was reborn doing this, right? This is this is the, the modern city of London is born out of offshore and butlering. This is what it does. So, yeah, that's been a huge. You know, driver of economic growth in the southeast of England and an earner of tax revenues. You know, and at some point, I think it became too big. This is what Nick Shatson writes about in The Finance Curse. It became too big and it became a drag on the economy rather than a, you know, a, a solely beneficial. It's very difficult, obviously, to say where that point is when it happens. And obviously, the temptation is always to try and push that a little bit further. But I think it's, you know, as I think as, as Nick writes, I think it's a very close analogy with what happens with with when you find oil. You know, the resource curse. You know, at first you're like, wow, free money, and then it's it, it almost invariably, you know, corrupts. Yeah, you know, there's this fascinating comparison between the economies of Nigeria and Tanzania, which started off at a very similar level at independence, and you know, and 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 oil has just ruined Nigeria. You know, and same with Libya. Um, there's this great line, I think, from the king of Libya before he was overthrown, you know, if only we'd struck water. And um, yeah, and that's, you know, that's the, you know, it, it's careful what you wish for. So, you know, there are benefits, obviously, you know, it brings in money and all that, but but it's a question of when it becomes too big. And I think in the long term, you do end up with this brain drain um, towards butlering because it's so profitable and there's so much money in it that you end up with, you know, your brightest people not becoming you know, more constructive people instead becoming servants to the super rich. And that has a knock on effect on all the other sectors of the economy. You know, I think it's, you know, is it connected that we seem to have a, you know, I don't know whatever the opposite of a golden generation of politicians at the moment. I mean, you look around, you know, the, the cabinet table, you see, do you don't think any, would one of them have got into John Major's cabinet or Tony Blair's cabinet? You know, I mean, Ben Wallace, maybe the defense secretary. That's, is there anyone else? They're just, there's no talent. And, and is that, think that's, do you think that's a function of that? Well, is that because of their generation, all the brightest people went and worked in the city, you know? And yeah, I mean, okay. Some people like Rishi Sunak came back from the city, but he's probably regretting it. And um, yeah, but that's not for, that's yeah. not for helpful altruistic well, reasons, well, is it? Well, <laughs> well, you know, but, but you know what I mean? I mean, I, so I do think that, I do think that, yeah, there are only so many people in a country, right? And, you know, if the, the brightest people go off to, to move money around for a living, you end up with not the brightest people running the country or running industry or, or running the health service or whatever. And that is a problem, you know? And so, you know, yes, you end up with, there might be some sort of altruistic people who, who, who do it out of the kindness of their heart. But, you know, do you want the country run by altruistic people? You No, I want you know, red in tooth and claw entrepreneurial people running the country, please, you know, and, and that's an issue. Mm. So, yeah, I do think in the long term, it's bad for the rest of the world. Um, and in the long term, it's bad for Britain. You know, I think it's, you, know, you need to have a financial sector because money, you know, needs to be reallocated from people who have it and don't need it to people who need it and don't have it, but it doesn't need to be this. Yeah. Yeah. And that like, so I pulled up this quote a while ago, actually from the book that I really, really enjoyed. Um, and they said, the, uh, the strange aspect of all of this is that the bank belonged to the nation. Surely, therefore, the government could just tell it what to do, mm -hmm. replace any directors who oppose its policies and force it to recruit economists to broaden its horizon. And this is a question I often have. <laughs> oh, the, Bank of the, the, the Bank of England is at the core of offshore. The Bank of England is what made offshore happen, what gave permission for it to happen, and, and, and or more importantly, didn't stop it from happening. Other countries stopped it happening. It, you know, the, the, the same dynamic that gave birth to offshore finance in the UK, it, it also happened in Switzerland, in Canada, in, in, in other places. Um, and, it, they, and it didn't go anywhere because they, it was squashed. It was because of the Bank of England that it wasn't squashed here. And there's, you know, these great, if you had a time machine, what would you do? You know, this great go back in time to the Attlee government and say, yes, nationalise the Bank of England, but also 
just change its entire managerial ethos completely, like just sweep it clean because they, they, they nationalized the Bank of England, but they didn't, it was still run by the elite of the merchant banks who'd always run it. And so it didn't actually change what it was doing. It didn't change how it functioned. Um, and, and that, you know, they didn't go far enough. And, and that it's just a small, tiny thing that at the time they must have, they had so many things to do, right? They must have thought, oh God, this isn't a battle worth picking. You know, like at the time the city was moribund, right? I mean, nothing was happening in the city anyway. Why bother? Yeah. You know, and yet it was bigger fish to fry. Exactly. They had to build the a health service and try and rebuild the economy and, and try and make sure everyone had food and everything. I mean, you know, th this seemed, must have seemed so irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And yet with retrospect, that unreformed bit of the economy was the bit that ended up, you know, dooming the Bretton Woods agreement and, and dooming the sort of favoring of productive over speculative capital and all the things that, you know, would have been great if we could have maintained it. So how to sort of, as a view of wrapping up here soon, because I know you have to go for your, for your other thing. I do, I do. Um, oh, don't look so bad. You know, better busy than, than <laughs> sitting around with nothing to do. No, it's just going to be a tough interview. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Are you saying this wasn't a hard interview? <laughs> yeah. <it's... laughs> How do we break this stranglehold of the, the, the and this, this, yeah, this this favouring of speculative capital over productive capital. Well, I mean that ship has sailed, right? That, I mean that you know that that's you know that is not right now the battle to pick. You know that is that is you know fifty years down the line. You know right now the issue is, to my mind, the fact that the money that pours through the city day in day out is unchecked, un and we have rules. Perfectly good rules, you know, mostly, I mean, mostly, not all perfectly good, but the changes to make to make them perfectly good are small. They're as good as anyone else's. Um, they're just not enforced. We don't have an enforcement apparatus that is capable of standing up to, you know, looking. It's like, you know, you've got this tidal wave of money, like, just all the time. And this constant gush, like, and, and you know, there's like no one checking it. Some and guy just standing there with a bucket. Yeah, or like one of, the, tide coming or one of those little <laughs> nets that you get for kids, you know, like a, like a green bamboo stick with a, you know, like one of them. And that's kind of where you're at trying to fish out the occasional thing. And like, they don't, they are swamped and they know they're swamped, you know, and, and it's really frustrating when, when, you know, the government will announce a, you know, a, a new, a new law and everything and you're like, oh great you know and then nothing changes because they don't enforce it and i was talking to a former official a few days ago who was saying the problem is that um the government loves announceables you know they have an announceable they have a new regulation a new law a new thing that they do but but the hard work of actually making that translate into real change is you know what's it david cameron said why should i do the hard shit yeah you know, and that's the attitude and it has been the attitude, not just under the Tories, but under Labour too. It's been the attitude for decades. And, you know, they, they get all the political, you know, credit for having passed a law and then they don't have to do any of the hard stuff. And I heard this called the other day legalisation by under resourcing, um, when essentially you, 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 you don't get rid of a law, you pass a law, the law exists, but you just don't enforce it. So it, essentially what you have is legal. And that's what we have, like this, you know, epidemic of fraud, like and just common or garden fraud. I'm not talking about like grand corruption, like mm -hmm. just people losing 20, 30, 40 grand, like life saving sums of money, mm -hmm. but life changing sums of money, but not enough for the police to bother returning their calls, you know, because, that, well, they're, you know, this is just happening every day. Yeah, there was this astonishing statement by the government in their document that they published alongside the Queen's speech that, you know, if you don't count fraud, um, then crime has fallen by 11%. You're like, so if you don't count the most common form of crime, crime has gone down. It's like, well, what is that? You know, if you don't count my stomach, I've lost weight. It's totally insane. And, and, and that's the way it is. They're just like, oh, fraud, fraud. It just happens. Yeah. It doesn't just happen. These are like, you know, these are like, you know, women have saved money all their lives. Their husband's dead and this is all they've got, mm -hmm. 30 grand, and they get conned out of it and that's it and it's done. And it's not just the, the financial loss, it's the humiliation. You know, I can remember when my... Um, my wife's uncle, he got conned by someone who said he'd repoint the front of his house. And, yeah, he was in his 80s and he'd, he'd been, a, he'd had a really successful career, you know, he'd been a really, like, impressive guy in his field. And, um, and he just felt diminished, small, because this asshole had defrauded him. And there's no 
push back. The police don't. They, they, it's not the police don't want to. The police are as angry about this as I am. You know, they just don't have the people or the time. You know, and that's what I find despicable. Really, is that the government's just yeah. And what's also final point, right? Because I can rant about this all day. Oh, please. What's particularly <laughs> annoying is that all examples of places where they have done this properly, investigated financial crime properly. Ireland has done a really good job of it. Spain has done a good job of it. Um, Italy has done a good job of it. The US has done a good job of it. It's a profit centre. If you the US in, has done a good job of it? The, U, yeah, the US is good at prosecuting, you know, big financial crimes, the big banks. <laughs> the, the US is like nine... The, I am going to take serious exception to that. Seriously. <laughs> if you look at the, the fines the US levied on HSBC, on BNP Paribas, on Standard Chartered, you're looking at nine-figure fines, billion-dollar fines. You know, that is that that will make anyone sit up and take notice that nothing like that has ever happened here. OK, you know, that's like, you know, comparatively then. Fair yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, massive. You know, look, there's nothing like that. There is no, no equivalent in any other country in the world. Yeah. I mean, no one's doing no one. OK, maybe a good job is a bad word. We're talking comparatively. <laughs> but, but in terms of like people who take it seriously, who investigate it, who do the hard yards, who bring the cases and win the cases, the US does that. You know, doesn't do everyone, obviously, but, you know, and maybe should, they should be doing more because everyone should be doing more. But but the annoying thing is that if you invest money in investigating and prosecuting financial crime, it's a, it, it makes money. Yeah. You, it's like a one to seven return. And so why don't we do that here? You know, we need money. Do it here. Take it from criminals. Anyway. That's a nice way to end things. Rant over. <laughs> Anything you'd like to plug before we finish? Obviously, your book, Moneyland. Uh, Not Moneyland, sorry. Money, Butler well, to the World. Butler Moneyland to the World. Well. Moneyland as well. Butler to the World. I mean, other other great books that we mentioned. We mentioned Nick Jackson's book, Treasure Islands and the Finance Curse. Great books. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and other books in this space. Uh, Catherine Belton's Putin's People. Fantastic book if you want a book on Putin. Um, uh, really, really uh, thorough, well-researched you know, astonishing piece of work. Um, and basically that's it. Okay. If you well, want to find out about me, I'm always on Twitter too much at Oliver Bullo. Um, and that's about it. Well, there we go. Thanks very much, man. Thank pleasure. you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. If you want to leave us a comment, that would be awesome. Please like, share, subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple, please leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.